Thank you all for being here. So my talk begins with the work of our own governor, Go Governor Schwarzenegger, who in 2005 announced the Western Governor's Climate Initiative. And when he made this announcement, he said the following. I say the debate is over. We know the science, we see the threat, and we know the time for action is now. Well, when this came out, my husband, Ken, who's sitting right here, said, Naomi, is somebody in Arnold's office reading your work? <laughs> <laughs> well, that would be nice, but I don't think that that, in fact, was the case. Um, many, many people, many journalists, many scientists have been trying to make the point that we do, in fact, know the science for some time. In fact, in 2004, Discover Magazine wrote an article on the top 10 scientific stories of the year, and the number one of the top 10 was the confirmation of global warming. And Discover called 2004 the year that global warming got respect. Well, the point is that in the last two years or so, the American people have clearly gotten the message. A poll that just came out a couple of weeks ago from the Yale Project on Climate Change taken in conjunction with a Gallup polling group, now shows that 72% of American citizens are completely or mostly convinced that global warming is happening. So this is quite an amazing statistic. It shows that the scientific message, in fact, is getting through to the American people. In fact, 62% of respondents believe that life on Earth will continue without major disruptions only if society takes immediately and drastic action to reduce global warming. Indeed, even many former contrarians have come around in the last year or so. One of the most interesting conversions that's taken place is that of Frank Luntz, the Republican strategist. Luntz said last year in an interview, it's now 2006. So that's a good sign, he got the first fact right. <laughs> And he went on to say, I think most people would conclude that there is global warming taking place and that the behavior of humans are affecting the climate. Some of you will remember that Frank Luntz is the strategist who wrote the now infamous memo to Republican candidates in which he urged them to use the phrase climate change rather than global warming because he said, quote, climate change is a lot less frightening than global warming. He said that in order to win the global warming debate, the political debate, that Republican candidates should emphasize the scientific uncertainty and insist that there was no scientific consensus. He argued in this memo, and all of the underscoring and italics and bolds here are his own. He wrote, the scientific debate remains open. Voters believe there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. Now, this was in 2003, but of course, the scientific community had something rather different to say. In 2001, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the largest international organization dealing with climate issues, in fact, one of the largest international scientific collaborations ever in the history of science, in 2001, in their third assessment report, they stated unequivocally that human activities are modifying the concentration of atmospheric constituents that absorb or scatter radiant energy. Most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. That was in 2001. But in fact, the scientific community had actually already come to a consensus that global warming was beginning to happen in 1995. In the 1995 second assessment report of the IPCC, the scientists involved came to the conclusion, quote, that the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human impact on global warming, sorry, on global climate. Now, in the last year or so, I've spoken to a lot of journalists who ask many questions, but one question that they never seem to ask is, who are the IPCC? And why was this organization ever created in the first place? And how did they already know in 1995 that climate change was, in their word, discernible? The IPC was established in 1988 by the United Nations Environment Program in collaboration with the World Meteorological Organization, a scientific organization that goes back to the 19th century that was established to facilitate the, the exchange of scientific data around the globe. 
But the creation of IPCC was a response to something quite specific, and it was the scientific predictions that were made in the 1970s that global warming due to greenhouse gas emissions was likely to become a serious problem. These predictions were the culmination of 50 years of scientific study. Now, it may be the case that Americans have only now gotten the message, but in fact, the scientific case has been building for more than five decades, arguably even longer. So let me tell you just a little bit about that scientific case. For many of you, I know this will be reviewed, but I think it's worthwhile being clear about what the scientific evidence really is. So we know that the Earth is warm, our planet is warm, because of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases are constituents like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor, which are very transparent to visible light. So sunlight comes in through our atmosphere very easily, but these gases are less transparent to heat, to infrared radiation. So when light comes in, it warms up the Earth, and then some of that warmth is re-radiated to space, and some of that is trapped by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Now, this is a good thing over, overall, because if there were no greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, our planet would be much, much colder. In fact, it would be something like the Moon or Mars, much, much colder planets. So greenhouse gases by themselves are a good thing. But as we all know, there can be too much of a good thing. And that's the problem that some scientists began to think about after the work of John Tyndall. It was Tyndall who first established that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas, um, that it had this distinctive property, and he did this work in the 1850s. So this is extremely long-established, well-established, uncontroversial science. But in the early 20th century, scientists realized that if carbon dioxide content changed, then the temperature of our planet could change too. This idea is now most famously associated with Svante Arrhenius, the great chemist who's famous, or until recently was mostly famous, for his contributions to chemical thermodynamics. But he also did some of the first calculations of what the effect of doubling atmospheric carbon dioxide would be. And he calculated that if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere, it would increase the average global temperature by about 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, so roughly 3 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, Arrhenius lived in Sweden, so he thought that warming would be a good thing. <laughs> but other people thought otherwise. And one of the first people to say that, that it might not be a good thing, that it might be too much of a good thing, was the British engineer Guy Callender. Callender was the first scientist to pursue this issue um, in a sustained way. And the first also to argue that the increase in carbon dioxide was actually already underway in the 1930s. And this led him to the question, if carbon dioxide is already increasing, then is temperature also increasing? And Callender thought that the answer to that was yes. And he showed that there was, in fact, a very slight temperature increase, appeared to be a slight temperature increase in the world from the 1880s to the mid-1930s. Nor was Callender alone. In 1931, a scientist named E.O. Hilbert, a physicist, published an article in Physical Review. Again, 1931, calculation shows that doubling or tripling the amount of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increases the average surface temperature by about 4 degrees or 7 degrees Kelvin or Celsius, respectively. So the point of this is simply to underscore the fact that the basic physics of the impact of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere was understood in the 1930s. Now, a lot of scientific work got interrupted in the 30s by, world, by first the Great Depression and then World War II, but the story picks up again in the 1950s. Now, one scientific uncertainty, a genuine uncertainty that people worried about at this time was the competing effect of water vapor. Because water vapor is also a greenhouse gas, so many people thought that the competing effect of water vapor would overwhelm any small effect from little tiny increases in carbon dioxide. But this issue was taken up and resolved in the 1950s by the physicist Gilbert Plass. Plass was a pioneer in satellite spectroscopy, one of the first people to use evidence from satellites to study the upper atmosphere. And in doing this, he resolved the absorption bands, this question of what the gases actually absorb, to a very much greater degree of specificity than anyone had before. 
And when he did this, he showed that the absorption bands of water and carbon dioxide did not, in fact, overlap. And this was a crucial thing to prove because it meant that the carbon dioxide problem was a real one. And it's that insight that really becomes crucial for the work that then begins here in San Diego and two people whose names will be familiar to many people here, Hans Seuss and Roger Revelle. In 1957, Seuss and Revelle published a now famous article in the scientific journal TELUS in which they said that humans were performing a great geophysical experiment. What was that geophysical experiment? And it was this that fossil fuels have accumulated on Earth over the course of hundreds of millions of years of geological time. They represent a kind of stored energy, almost a bank deposit of energy. But now, in the 20th century or beginning in the end of the 19th century with the Industrial Revolution, humans had begun burning those fossil fuels at a very rapid rate and were putting back into the atmosphere over the course of just a few decades carbon dioxide that had been stored over the course of hundreds of millions of years. And Ravel and Zeus had the insight that this was an unbelievable thing to be going on and that it could have very significant consequences. When Ravel did talk to public audiences about this issue, he did make clear that he thought it was potentially a grave issue. In 1957, he gave an interview with Time magazine and the article was written up under an a title, an article entitled One Big Greenhouse, and the article ran like this. If the blanket of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere produces a temperature rise of only one or two degrees, a chain of secondary effects may come into play. As the air gets warmer, seawater will get warmer too, and carbon dioxide dissolved in it will return to the atmosphere, possibly raising the temperature enough to melt the ice caps of Antarctica and Greenland, which would flood the Earth's coastal lands. Dr. Ravel has not reached the stage of warning against this catastrophe, but he and other geophysicists intend to keep watching and recording. And of course, that is exactly what they did. The CO2 inventory became the life's work of Charles Dave David Keeling, and Professor Keeling asked the central and key question, or one of the key questions in this whole story, how much of the carbon dioxide being released by burning fossil fuels will go into the atmosphere as compared to how much of it might be absorbed by the oceans or taken up by plants in the biosphere. So Dr. Keeling began measuring carbon dioxide very, very carefully. And within a very short period of time, by about 1965, it became clear, based on his data, that roughly half of the carbon dioxide was going into the atmosphere and staying there, and it was leading to a detectable rise in just a few years. And so by 1965, a number of Professor Keeling's co colleagues began to think, well, yeah, here's the evidence of the carbon dioxide inventory, that carbon dioxide is, in fact, staying in the atmosphere, not being entirely dissolved by the ocean, and possibly could lead to serious effects. Now, the 1957 Time article concluded, when all their data have been studied, they may be able to predict whether man's factories, chimneys, and auto exhausts will eventually cause salt water to flow in the streets of New York and London. In fact, by 1964, scientists were making that prediction. And one of the first committees to take up this issue was a committee of the National Academy of Sciences led by the geophysicist Gordon MacDonald, who also taught here at UCSD for a period of time. MacDonald headed a committee of the Academy um, entitled Scientific Problems of Weather Modification, a report of the panel on weather and climate modification. Now, this was a group of scientists who were asked to study the question of weather modification that the US government was interested in for, for agricultural and military purposes. <laughs> but in the process of evaluating these data and thinking about whether it would be possible to deliberately change weather for military or other purposes, McDonald and his colleagues realized that it also might be possible to change weather and climate by accident that you might be doing things that you didn't intend to change the climate, but they might, in fact, do that. And they called that inadvertent weather modification. And in the report, they specifically referred to the possibility of inadvertent weather modification from carbon dioxide. And I actually interviewed uh, Gordon McDonald before his death, and I asked him about this, and I said, well, how did you know that carbon dioxide was rising? And he said, oh, because of Dave Killing's work. <laughs> 
So we know that already by 65, people understood the significance of what Keeling was doing. The following year, Ravel and Keeling led a committee of the President's Science Advisory Committee Board on Environmental Pollution. And in this report, they wrote, quote, by the year 2000, there will be about 25% more carbon dioxide in our atmosphere than at present, and this will modify the heat balance of the atmosphere to such an extent that market changes in climate, not controllable through local or even national efforts, could occur. Now that was 1965, and one of the interesting things I've discovered is that in those days, politicians actually listened to science, because a few months later, the following statement was made. This generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. President Lyndon B. Johnson in a special message to Congress in 1965. So if anybody ever says to you, well, nobody could have predicted what we now know to be true, the answer to that is not only could they have, but they did. Now, I want to emphasize here that these committees that I've been refer referring to were extremely distinguished committees and bipartisan. The idea that this was somehow a debate, that the science was somehow Democratic or Republican, is nowhere to be seen in any of these conversations. And moreover, we know for a fact that many of these people served both Democratic and Republican administrations. McDonald served on the President's Science Advisory Committee under both Presidents Johnson and Nixon, and he was one of the original members of President Nixon's Council on Environmental Quality. On the other hand, the PSAC committee with Ravel Killing uh, also includes Joseph Smagorinsky, who was the head of the U.S. Weather Service, and Harmon Craig, uh, an isotope geochemist who also taught here at UCSD. But compared with other pollution issues of the day and other issues going on in 1965, the issue of greenhouse gases clearly seemed relatively minor and far off in the future in 2000. But things began to change in the 1970s when three different independent scientific reports suggested that the problem might be serious. One was a report of the National Research Council headed by Robert White, the first director of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. A second was a report called The Long-Term Impact of Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide and Climate issued by the Jason Committee, about whom I'll say more in a moment. And the third was a National Research Committee study group on carbon dioxide, sometimes now referred to as the Charney Report. Well, let me talk about Robert White first. So as I said, White was the first director of NOAA, and in a report that was published in 1979, but he also wrote about it in the, the previous year in 78, he wrote, quote, we now understand that industrial wastes, such as carbon dioxide released during the burning of fossil fuels, can have consequences for climate that pose a considerable threat to future society. Experiences have demonstrated the consequence of even modest fluctuations in climatic conditions and have lent a new urgency to the study of climate. The scientific problems are formidable, the technological problems unprecedented, and the potential economic and social impacts ominous. That was in 1978. The following year, in 1979, the Jason Committee took up the question. Some of you here know about Jason. It's a rather re reclusive committee of extremely elite scientists, mostly physicists, founded in the 1960s to advise the US government on science and technology. In 1979, the Jason Committee wrote a report commissioned by the US Department of Energy. The context was the 1973 Arab oil embargo. And in response to the oil embargo, first President Nixon and then later President Carter proposed an increase in the use of coals and also the possibility of developing synthetic fuels from coal or other coal-like substances. But a number of scientists on the Jason Committee, including Gordon MacDonald, became concerned about the implications of dramatically increased use of coal, because coal produces even more carbon dioxide per heat unit than oil or gas do. So the Jason Committee took up this question, and they wanted to try to understand the issue in terms of what they called the basic principles of, quote, radiative equilibrium and energy budgets. In other words, the basic science, the basic physics that controls the thermal equilibrium of the planet. The conclusion that they came to was that at current fossil fuel rates, atmospheric carbon dioxide would double by 2035. 
and that this would perturb the climate by alterating the radiative properties of the atmosphere. In other words, changing the chemistry of the atmosphere, the chemistry and physics, in ways that would have discernible effects. They also built two models, an early computer model and also what's known as an analytic model, or just a simple equations without the use of any computer. And in both of these models, they were able to predict that the temperature change would be about two and a half to three degrees C. They also predicted an effect which we now call polar amplification, that the effect would be greatest at the poles, maybe as much as 10 to 12 degrees increase in temperature at the poles for a doubling of CO2. So in other words, four or five times as great as the global average. Well, I want to jump ahead in my narrative for just a moment because it's not that common that scientific predictions actually come true, or at least not that common that they come true to a high degree of specificity. But this is an example of a prediction that has come true to a startling degree. So this is a map recently released by NOAA that shows the mean surface temperature increase compared to a base period, 1951-1980, but not just average for the whole world, but showing you how the changes are different in different regions. So the global mean increase for this period, or now compared to this period, is half a degree centigrade. But look at the polar regions. Look at Alaska. The increase in Alaska is 2.1 degrees. That's four times the global mean. That's exactly what the Jason Committee predicted in 1979. Now, we know from documentary evidence that the Jason report reached the Carter White House, where science advisor Frank Press decided to ask the National Academy of Sciences for a second opinion. And that second opinion is what's now known as the Charney Report. The Charney Report concluded, if carbon dioxide continues to increase, we find no reason to doubt that climate changes will result and no reason to believe that these changes will be negligible. It's the old scientific double negative, but you get the point. <laughs> now, an important point is that the Charney Report was actually not an original scientific study, but a kind of meta-study or an integration or a summary of a great deal of climate modeling and carbon cycling studies that had been done over the previous decade by a number of different government and academic scientific organizations, including the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, the Department of Energy, NOAA, a number of academic groups, etc. It also summarized international studies that had been done by the World Meteorological Organization and other groups as well. And indeed, when the Academy issued the Charney Report, they issued with it a press release which emphasized that this wasn't just one report, but that it was in fact a summary of diverse scientific work. And they wrote in the press release, quote, a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. So no double negative there. A very clear statement of what it was that scientists felt they had come to understand. In short, there was already a consensus in 1979 that global warming would happen and that it was not a small issue. They also wrote, quote, the close linkage between man's welfare and, and the climatic regime within which his society has evolved suggests that such climatic changes would have profound impacts on human society. It was these impacts, sorry, these insights that led in 1988 to the creation of the IPCC. This is why the IPCC exists to analyze the temperature records, to understand whether or not global warming was already happening, to predict to a greater degree of accuracy what the likely future events would be, to predict when those effects would happen, and to suggest possible solutions. Now again, another little known or little remembered fact of history, these conclusions, these scientific conclusions, also led to the National Energy Policy Act of 1988, an act which Roger Revelle lent his support to. The purpose of the act was, quote, to establish a national energy policy that will quickly reduce the generation of carbon dioxide and trace gases as quickly as is feasible in order to slow the pace and degree of atmospheric warming to protect the global environment. The issue, including the introduction of this act, was reported in the New York Times in August of 1988. And at that time, the Times wrote, the issue of an overheating world 
has suddenly moved to the forefront of public concern. And again, something that many people seem to have forgotten, in 1992, world leaders met in Rio de Janeiro, where they adopted the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And one of the nations that signed the United Nations Framework Convention was the United States. President George H.W. Bush signed the Framework Convention, and when he did, he pledged and called on world leaders to translate the written document, quote, into concrete action to protect the planet. One environmentalist I've spoken with, Gus Spieth, who served on the Council of Environmental Quality in the Carter administration, said to me recently, we thought we were on track to make real changes. So what happened? If scientists understood in 1979 that global warming was going to happen, and if they knew by the early 1990s that it was starting to happen, and if our first President Bush signed the UN Framework Convention, why are we still here? in 2007, still arguing about whether global warming is even happening. Well, so I'd like to move on now to the second half of my talk. The first half has been sort of about the science, and now I want to move on to the second half, which is the denial part. So the first half was the truth, and the second half is the denial. Um, and I've spent quite a bit of time over the last year or so really trying to understand what has happened here in the United States in the past 15 or 20 years. And I believe the answer is suggested by one very strange poll result. The fact is that although the American people are now convinced that global warming is indeed happening, more than half of the American people still think that scientists are still arguing about it. Now, if you think about this, this is pretty darn weird, right? <laughs> because if scientists were really still arguing about it, then how could we possibly know that it was actually happening? So this is a little bit of a perplexing result. But on the other hand, there is an actually, actually a rather simple answer, that we, the American people, think that scientists are still arguing about it because this is, in fact, what we have been repeatedly told. If we go back to Luntz, who I mentioned a few moments ago, remember that in 2003, so this is now uh, nine, 11 years after the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, in 2003, he wrote, the scientific debate remains open. You need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue. And although Luntz has now given up that strategy, other Republicans, I'm sorry to say, have not. So just this past February, in an interview with ABC News on the occasion of the release of the fourth report of the IPCC, our Vice President Dick Cheney said the following, I think there is an emerging consensus that we do have global warming. Where there does not appear to be a consensus is the extent to which that's part of a normal cycle versus the extent to which it's caused by man, greenhouse gases, etc. But it's not just a matter of what we've been told since 2003. It is, in fact, a much deeper problem than that. Virtually since the same time that the IPCC was created, there have, in fact, been a steady stream of claims challenging climate science. These claims include that there's no proof that the science is uncertain, that there's no consensus that scientists are divided, that if warming is happening, it's not anthropogenic, it's just natural variability, or if it is anthropogenic, it isn't necessarily bad, that we can adapt to any changes that might occur, and that controlling greenhouse gas emissions would cost jobs, harm, even destroy the US economy. For the past 20 years, the major, the single largest and most significant source of these challenges has been a think tank based in Washington, DC, called the George C. Marshall Institute. I visited the website of the Institute uh, in February 2003, right when the IPCC fourth assessment report was coming out. Yet that same month, on the Marshall Institute website, you could find a link to a Canadian climatologist named Timothy Ball, who argues that the widely propagated fact, fact in scare quotes, that humans are contributing to global warming is, quote, the greatest deception in the history of science. In June, I visited their website again. And in June, you could find a, web, a link to an article by Pat Michaels, a very well-known contrarian, who argued that, quote, the science is far from settled. Again, June of this year, the science of warming is far from settled. You can see it right here. 
So I wanted to know, as a historian, one always asks the same question. Where did this thing come from? Where did it start and who did it? I wanted to know where did the Marshall Institute come from and related, how did scientific uncertainty become a political tactic that could be proposed and used by people like Luntz? Well, the Marshall Institute was founded in 1984. And it was founded by this man, Robert Jastrow, a well-known astrophysicist who for many years was the head of the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Full disclosure, he was also briefly my own colleague when I taught in the Department of Earth Sciences at Dartmouth College. In 1984, just about the time that Jastrow uh, was uh, teaching at Dartmouth as an adjunct professor after he had left the Goddard Institute, Jastrow recruited two close colleagues, men he had known for many, many years, to join the board of directors. And these two men were Frederick Seitz, a prominent physicist, well known for his work on solid state physics, and this man who will be familiar to some of you here, Professor William Nuremberg of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Now the initial purpose of creating the Marshall Institute was quite specific. It was to defend Ronald Reagan's strategic defense initiative from attacks by physicists. By May of 1986, 6,500 academic scientists had signed a pledge not to take funds from the missile defense program. So Jastrow enlisted Nuremberg and Seitz to work with him to set up an institute that would defend SDI by showing that not all physicists were against it. And so the tactic that they would take on would be to write letters to the editor, op-ed pieces, and articles for conservative venues like Commentary and the Wall Street Journal that would be sympathetic to SDI and would be willing to publish their perspective. And the strategy was to show the American people that scientists were not unified in their opposition, but in fact were arguing about it. In 1984, Jastrow wrote to Bill Nirenberg, my commentary article is enclosed. It seems to have been effective in generating debate. Commentary in the Wall Street Journal have been getting calls and letters from Sagan, Beta, and many others. Now, it's important to point out here that it was not a scientific research institute. It never, the Marshall Institute never did original scientific research. It never attempted to raise funds to do research. That was not the purpose or the point. The plan was never, furthermore, to debate fellow scientists in the halls of science, but rather to carry on a debate in the mass media. Moreover, part of the strategy was that if the media did not give them equal time for their views, they would threaten to sue under the Fairness Doctrine. So as an example of this, in 1986, public broadcasting planned to air a show on SDI that prominently featured physicists who opposed the program. Jastrow considered the program to be one-sided, and he wrote a letter on Marshall Institute letterhead, in which, which was sent to every single public television station in America threatening lawsuits if the program were aired. Jastrow wrote, the program presents only one side of a matter of great national import. And he argued that stations that aired the program, quote, could incur obligations under the fairness doctrine to provide airtime for presentation of contrasting viewpoints. What was the result? He concluded, quote, very few public TV stations aired the program. The tactic clearly worked, and they continued. He wrote, quote, we intend to continue monitoring the use of public TV for presentation of one-sided programs on technical issues affecting national security. In other words, that they would pressure the media for balance. But there's two important things to note here. One, of course, is that if you have 6,500 physicists opposing a program and three supporting it, then what kind of balance would it be if you gave equal time to the three? And in fact, this is the issue which subsequently, as many of you know, became a crucial point in the whole presentation of global warming. Because a recent study done, again by more UC colleagues, Max and Jules Boykoff at UC Santa Barbara, has demonstrated the success of the balance tactic. In an analysis of news media, print news media coverage of the issue of global warming, the Boykoff showed that more than 50%, more than half, of all articles public, published in prestige media, like the New York Times and the Washington Post, 
More than 52% of those articles gave equal time to the view that global warming either wasn't happening or wasn't demonstrated as to the view that we could say was consistent with the IPCC or other mainstream scientific positions. Um, only about a third of the papers reflected the actual scientific perspective that the anthropogenic contribution to global warming was dominant. So this study clearly shows that this tactic of demanding balance has proved to be highly effective, most likely in part because it appeals to journalists' own sense of fairness and objectivity that they are, in fact, supposed to provide balanced coverage of important issues, built into the fairness doctrine which journalists have all been raised with. Now, of course, the irony of this story is twofold. One is the issue of balance between 6,500 and 3, but the other irony is at the very moment that the, this is going on, the Reagan administration was, in fact, in the process of dismantling the fairness doctrine because it viewed it as an unnecessary government intervention in communication markets. Jastro never talked about that. Now, there were other issues that the Marshall Institute also got involved in the mid-1980s. These included nuclear winter, seismic verification, and the future of the manned space program. These were all issues related to the Cold War, to weapons and rocketry programs, and they were all issues that these physicists had considerable expertise and experience dealing with. But in 1989, the Cold War ended. So you might think that the Marshall Institute would have disbanded, but it didn't. Instead, it turned to the issue of global warming which became one of its major issues that it dealt with and it continues to deal, deal with even today. It began to develop position papers and issue reports, and just as they did with SDI, they developed a position that was contrary to the majority or mainstream scientific community. In 1999, Jastrow, Nuremberg, and Seitz wrote the first of many articles and pamphlets and op-ed pieces on global warming, entitled, Global Warming, What Does the Science Tell Us? And here they claimed, contrary to the Charney Report, contrary to the Jason Committee, contrary to the emerging evidence from the IPCC, that there was little or no evidence that warming was occurring or would occur any time soon. Moreover, even if it did, they argued, there was no greenhouse, quote, problem because technology would enable us to adapt so long as the government didn't interfere with the free market. In 1992, the following year, they wrote a second report called The Scientific Perspectives on the Greenhouse Problem. Remember, again, this is the same year of the UN Framework Convention and the same year that a significant fraction of the scientific community be begins to say that warming is, in fact, discernible in climate records. But now the Marshall Institute directly challenged these scientific results. They denied that the climate records revealed current warming and again argued that even if it did occur, technology would permit adaptation. And they now went one step further, arguing that there was therefore no need for international treaties, such as the Framework Convention on Climate Change, and no need for regulation. Now, in the early 1990s, it definitely looked like they were going to lose that debate. As I've already mentioned, President George H.W. Bush signed the UN Framework Convention and committed the United States to taking action to combat global warming. But instead of accepting the conclusion, this conclusion, the conclusion of the IPC and their own president, rather, they deepened and sharpened the attacks. And as the science became firmer, the attacks became harsher and more personal. I don't have time to talk about all the details, um, but I just want to talk a little bit about one important incident. As I've already mentioned, in 1995, the IPCC concluded that the human effect on climate was now discernible. The lead author of the key chapter on detection and attribution, that is to say, how do we know things are warming up and how do we know it's caused by human activities and not natural variation, the lead author of that chapter was a scientist at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory named Benjamin J. Santer. When the IPCC report came out, Seitz, Nirenberg, and now a fourth physicist, a man by the name of S. Fred Singer, launched a highly personal attack on Santer. In an open letter to the IPCC, which they sent to numerous members of the US Congress, Singer, Seitz, and Nirenberg accused Santer of making, quote, unauthorized changes to the IPCC reports to downplay the scientific uncertainties and to make the science seem firmer 
than it really was, or so they charged. They followed this with an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal entitled, A Major Deception on Global Warming. This piece was written by Seitz, in which he claimed that the effect of the alleged changes was, quote, to deceive policymakers and the public. Now, Santa replied in a letter to the editor of the Wall Street Journal, and in the response, he explained that he had made changes, but those were changes were in response to the peer review process. In other words, totally normal scientific practice, that IPCC reports, like any scientific paper, are reviewed by peer scientists who make criticisms, and the, it is the obligation of the authors to respond to those criticisms, and if the criticisms are valid, to make changes. And that's exactly what Santer had done. This account was corroborated by the chairman of the IPCC and by all of the other authors of the chapter. In fact, there were over 40 scientists who were co-authors on this chapter. So the letter was signed by Santer and 40 others and published in the Wall Street Journal in June of 1996. And Santer was also formally defended by the American Meteorological Society. But neither Seitz nor Singer ever retracted the charges, which were then repeated many times over and over again by industry groups and think tanks. And in fact, if you Google Ben Santer, these same charges are still on the internet today. In fact, one site that I visited said that it was proven in 1996 that Santer had fraudulently altered the IPCC report. The Wall Street Journal did publish Santer's reply, but two weeks after that, they gave Fred Singer the last word, in which he wrote yet another letter in which he claimed that sites had, quote, revealed that the IPCC had been tampered with for political reasons. And that became the last word in the Wall Street Journal on this particular incident. Now, two years later, Ben Santer read a newspaper article about scientists who had participated in a program sponsored by the tobacco industry to discredit the science linking smoking to cancer. And the article explained that the strategy that the tobacco industry had used was, quote, to keep the controversy alive. And Santer thought that the whole thing sounded eerily familiar. Well, he was right, because not only were the tactics the same, in fact, some of the people were the same too. So let me say a few more words about Frederick Seitz. Seitz was an extremely distinguished physicist. He had trained at Princeton under the great physicist Eugene Wigner, who had one of the original scientists on the Manhattan Project. In the 1960s, Seitz had served on the President's Science Advisory Committee under both Presidents Kennedy and Johnson. From 1965 to 68, he was, the he was the president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and from 68 to 78, the president of the Rockefeller University. Now, I've given this talk several times before, and when I get to this point, I always feel a bit awkward, because it's not my intention to discredit or defame the reputation of a distinguished person. But it is important to talk about who Frederick Seitz was because it's important for us to understand that he was not a nobody. Because if he had been a nobody, then nobody would have listened to him. And there's one more part of the story, which is Frederick Seitz's last paying job. In 1979, Frederick Seitz became an advisor to the R.J. Reynolds Corporation. His job was to direct a medical research program to confound the links between tobacco and cancer. Between 1975 and 1989, the RJR Nabisco Company, the parent company of RJ Reynolds Tobacco, spent $45 million on this program. And from 1978 onwards, Seitz was its director. The focus of the program was to, quote, identify highly promising young investigators who are underfunded at present, and to fund them to do research that could be then used to argue that the scientific evidence was uncertain. In a 1979 speech to tobacco executives, Seitz explained how he had come to work for the Reynolds Corporation. Quote, about a year ago, when my period as president of the Rockefeller University was nearing its end, I was asked if I would be willing to serve as advisor to the board of directors of R.J. Reynolds Industries, Inc., as it developed its program on the support of biomedical research related to degenerative diseases in man, a program which would enlarge upon the work supported through the consortium of tobacco industries. <laughs> 
Since R.J. Reynolds had provided very generous support for the biomedical work at the Rockefeller University, I was more than glad to accept. A former Reynolds CEO, a man by the name of Colin Stokes, explained the goals of the research program. He said that the charges that tobacco was linked to cancer, hardening of the arteries, and carbon monoxide poisoning were, quote, tenuous. Quote, Reynolds and other cigarette makers have reacted to these scientifically unproven claims by intensifying our funding of objective research into these matters. And he defended the program on the grounds of scientific uncertainty, claiming, quote, that science really knows very little about the causes or development mechanisms of chronic degenerative diseases imputed to cigarettes, including lung cancer, emphysema, and cardiovascular disorders. Many of the studies that link smoking to these diseases, he argued, were, quote, either incomplete or relied on dubious methods or hypotheses and faulty interpretations. The overall goal of the program is made clear in the numerous documents that are available uh, on the Tobacco Legacy Document websites to, from which I've drawn these materials. The goal, it is clear from these documents, was to create reasonable doubt that could be used in court to protect the tobacco industry from litigation. And Stokes boasted, quote, due to favorable scientific testimony, no plaintiff has ever collected a penny from any tobacco company in lawsuits claiming that smoking causes lung cancer or cardiovascular diseases, even though 117 such cases have been brought since 1954. Now that was in the night, late 1970s. Of course, it's different now, and because the tobacco industry eventually did lose these lawsuits, these documents were made public through the, the discovery process. But it shows you how the strategy and tactics were developed to focus not on proving that tobacco was safe, but simply on creating reasonable doubt. Now let me talk about one more man in this story, S. Fred Singer, the man who led the attack on Ben Santer. Singer was also a physicist who had built his career in the heyday of Cold War. He was, in fact, a rocket scientist who was the first director of the National Weather Satellite Program. In the 1980s, he became chief scientist at the Department of Transportation in the Reagan administration, and in the 1990s, began working with Seitz and Nuremberg on challenging climate science. Like Jastro before him, he wrote extensively for the mass media, especially in sympathetic business-oriented journals, and the pattern was always consistent. Not to prove that global warming wasn't happening, but to create doubt. To create, to emphasize the uncertainty, and to argue, as Jastro and the others had before in the case of SDI, that scientists were not all in agreement. Between 1989 and 2003, Singer published at least 35 articles, letters, and op-ed pieces in popular journals challenging the scientific evidence of global warming. Again, not in peer-reviewed scientific literature, but in popular literature. And during this time, many websites and list service servers developed around the country, citing arguments found in his work and that of other individuals affiliated with the Marshall Institute. And then it was picked up by talk radio. But it wasn't just global warming. In the 1980s, Singer challenged the scientific evidence linking sulfur and nitrogen emissions to acid rain. In the 1990s, he testified in Congress that there was no scientific consensus linking CFCs to the creation of the ozone hole. And this is my favorite because he testified in October 1995 that there was no scientific consensus that chlorinated fluorocarbons damaged the stratospheric ozone. And three weeks later, Sherry Rowland, Mario Molina, and Paul Crutzen won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for demonstrating <laughs> that connection. And Singer also defended tobacco. For Singer, the issue was environmental tobacco smoke. By the 1990s, it was no longer credible to claim that tobacco didn't cause adverse health effects, but a new issue had developed, which was the issue of what we generally call secondhand smoke. Today, if you go to the website of the Department of Health and Human Services, it says, quote, there is no risk-free level of exposure to secondhand smoke. Even small amounts of secondhand smoke can be harmful to people's health. That's today. But this has, in fact, been known for some time as well. In fact, in 1986, the Surgeon General issued a report on the health consequences of what he called involuntary smoking. 
The conclusion of the 1986 report was that involuntary smoking is a cause of disease, including lung cancer, in otherwise healthy non-smokers. But in 1994, Fred Singer challenged the scientific evidence behind that report and further work that had been done by the US Environmental Protection Agency. And in a report entitled EPA and the Science of Environmental Tobacco Smoke, which you can read yourself on the tobacco legacy documents that are available on the internet, this report was written on behalf of an institute called the Alexis de Tocqueville Institute, which was established to conduct research on, quote, the costs and benefits of regulation. The report was supported by a $20,000 grant from the Tobacco Institute, ostensibly for the Alexis de Tocqueville's, quote, research and education projects. And here's what Singer said in this report. In its zeal to abolish smoking, science has been sacrificed. Scientific standards were seriously violated in order to produce a report to justify a political agenda, he charged. What was this violation? Well, the violation, he claimed, was the use of what's known as a linear dose response model with no threshold value. So what that means is simply the assumption that the more you smoke, the greater the risk, and it, essentially the risk goes up in a straight line as the amount of exposure goes up, as opposed to a threshold value, which would be the claim that there's some safe level of smoking that you could do up to a point that would have no harm, but then above that threshold, things would start to get dangerous. So Singer wrote that the EPA should, quote, not reject the possibility of a threshold effect for ETS. Of course, that could be right, but he presented no evidence that there was such a threshold effect. Instead, he evoked the Paracelsian motto, quote, the dose makes the poison. I love this when I read it, I almost fell off my chair because of course, Every historian of science knows that Paracelsus lived from 1493 to 1541. So Fred Singer is fighting the EPA with 500-year-old science. <laughs> now in the press release, Fred Singer stressed that his report was peer-reviewed. But if you look at the list of the members of the Academic Advisory Board who are supposed, who were presented as the reviewers, we find that of the 19 individuals listed, including Singer himself, 10 were economists. Two were fellows at the Hoover Institution, and one was a mineralogist. Not one was a professor of medicine or of epidemiology. But Singer's co-author summarized their conclusion. I can't prove that ETS is not a risk of lung cancer, but EPA can't prove that it is. Well, the four physicists lost all of these debates. Acid rain was proven to be caused by acid emissions. CFCs were demonstrated to be linked to the destruction of the ozone layer and were banned. And environmental tobacco smoke does cause lung cancer. And yet, they were able to use the same argument again and again and again. That the science was uncertain, that the concerns were exaggerated, that technology will solve the problem, and there's no need for government interference. I call this the tobacco strategy. So the question is, why would distinguished scientists do this? Why would scientists attack science? And why would scientists <coughs> defend tobacco? It's politics. And it's actually something rather specific. It's the issue of regulation. Because in each of these cases, the underlying goal of the work that these men did was to stave off government regulation. And it was underscored by an ideological position which has been known and been around for a long time, the ideology of laissez-faire, of letting free markets do their thing without government interference. Now, SDI was a little bit different because SDI was about the Cold War. And the goal of SDI was the same as all Cold War US weapons and rocketry programs, to defend the United States against Soviet communism and to win the Cold War. But the link to SDI is important because it, it's connected to the ideological position that underlines all of the work that these men did. Jastrow, Seitz, Nuremberg, and Singer were all fiercely anti-communists. They were also fiercely pro-market and therefore opposed to government regulation and control. 
So it seems to me that these men were an example of what George Soros has called market fundamentalists. That they had a kind of unshakable faith in the invisible hand of the marketplace to solve all problems and an intractable hostility to government regulation as a form of creeping communism. In fact, in some of the journals in which they've published, I've found references to environmentalists as, quote, watermelons, green on the outside, but red on the inside. <laughs> so now it becomes clear why global warming is so important, because energy is at the root of all economic activity. Everything we do, everywhere we go, everything we make, every vacation we take, all implicate us in using energy and therefore in using fossil fuels. Singer, Seitz, Jastrow, and Nuremberg all worried that global warming would lead the United States to agree to international treaties like the UN Framework Convention, like the Kyoto Protocol, which would undermine national sovereignty. And that in effect, that having won the Cold War, we would in, fact, in effect lose the peace. Now, some of us are old enough to remember Barry Goldwater and his argument that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. But I think this story clearly shows precisely how it is, that extremism of all kinds is in a, indeed a vice. Because these men may have been perfectly justified in having the political beliefs that they held. But the crucial part of this story is that they did not make a political argument on political grounds. Rather, they disguised a political argument as a scientific one and camouflaged a political debate as a scientific debate. And in the process, they greatly misrepresented the facts about climate science, they confused the American people, and they delayed political action on one of the most pressing global issues of our time. In the 1980s, one of Bill Nuremberg's fa favorite arguments about global warming was to say that we could afford to wait and see. Well, the fact is that we actually have waited and we have seen. And what we have seen is that the predictions of the 1970s and 80s and even the 1950s have largely come true. Global warming is here and there are almost no communists left. <laughs> Thank you very much.